Here we have the equation for the synthesis or how to make acetyl salicylic acid, also called aspirin. This equation provides us a visual representation of how the atoms rearrange themselves during the course of a reaction. It also gives us information on the reacting masses, how many grams we need of each reactant and how many grams we're going to get of each product. Today we're going to take a look at how that happens. The steps to solving mass problems. We need to begin with a chemical equation and we're usually told something about one of the substances in that equation and asked to relate that to the mass of another substance in the equation. The first step that I need to do is ensure that the equation is balanced before I begin. Then, beginning with my known substance, substance A in this case, I'm going to convert that into moles. To do that, I use the equation that allows me to do it. The number of moles is the mass over the molar mass of substance A. Next thing I'm going to do with those moles of substance A is predict how many moles of substance C will be produced. To do that, I consult the coefficients of each of these chemicals. In this case, the coefficient for A is 1, and the coefficient for substance C is 2. Hence, they will be in a 1 to 2 ratio. Moles of C will be twice as big as the moles of A. Lastly, I'm going to convert the moles of substance C now into the mass of substance C. And again, I need knowledge of the molar mass to do that. So these are the steps that we'll go through in our sample problem. In my sample problem, I'm going to begin with 1.56 grams of iron oxide, which essentially is iron oxide ore. And in my first question, I'm determined how many grams of substance C of, I should say, carbon I need to react with it. So I begin with balancing the equation. The first thing I notice here is I have three oxygens present in the iron oxide and two in carbon dioxide. So the common multiple there will be six. So I'm going to double my first substance and that will result in a coefficient of three for carbon dioxide and four iron atoms. And now I'll balance the carbon. So my equations now balance, the first step. I place the 15.6 grams of iron oxide underneath the iron oxide, and now I'm going to convert that into moles of iron oxide by dividing by the molar mass. An important thing to remember here is the molar mass is the mass of one mole of iron oxide, not two. So you don't pay any attention to that two that's in front. That's taken care of in our next step. So the molar mass here, I have the 159, is for one mole of iron three oxide. So performing that operation, I arrive at the moles of iron oxide. My next step is to consult the coefficients in the equation. A 2 to 3 ratio exists between the moles of iron oxide and the moles of carbon. So I'm going to multiply the 0 0.0968 by 3 and divide by 2, or multiply by 1.5. And, and that now arrives at my moles of carbon. My next step is to convert the moles of carbon using the molar mass of carbon into grams. So I multiply it, and I arrive at 1.76 grams of carbon. Notice I have three significant digits in my final answer. That's because my given starting information had three, but I did carry one more decimal than was needed in my calculations of the moles. But I did round off at the end to the appropriate number. Sometimes this can also pre be presented as a series of unit conversions. I'll show you how that works. I want to determine the mass of carbon and I begin with 15.6 grams of iron oxide. In my first step, I multiply it by 1 over the molar mass, which is the same as dividing by the molar mass. You'll notice here that the grams of iron oxide will cancel. So at the end of this first operation, I've arrived at the moles of iron oxide. My next conversion uses the coefficients in the equation, the 3 and the 2. And again, the iron oxide is located so that it will cancel out of my expression and I now would be arriving at the moles of carbon. My last step is to molar, modif, multiply by the molar mass of carbon, 12 grams per mole, and the moles of carbon cancel. So performing that calculation, I'll arrive at exactly the same answer. But here it's shown uh, using unit conversion. Both methods will arrive at the same answer. I want to continue this question now and look at another point of it. In this case, I would like to determine the mass of iron that would be produced with my same starting amount. So all that's going to change here is how I work around the equation. My first step is exactly the same, converting the information to moles of carbon. But now I want to go from iron oxide to carbon, and the ratio there is 2 to 4. I can simplify that to a 1 to 2 ratio. So I need to double 
the moles that I have of iron oxide. Now I want to convert those moles of iron oxide into grams of iron by multiplying by the molar mass of iron. And I get 10.9 grams. Again, using unit conversion, I can take each of the substances and multiply it by the appropriate conversion factor and arrive at exactly the same answer. Now a third part to this question. Someone actually goes ahead and performs this particular experiment and recovers in their crucible at the end of the experiment 11.9 grams of iron and we're asked to determine the percentage yield of this experiment. Percentage yield by definition is the actual amount obtained divided by the theoretical amount times 100. Now the theoretical amount is the 10.9 that I obtained in the earlier part. That's the maximum amount I should be able to get based on 15.6 grams of iron oxide. The actual yield in this experiment was 11.7, giving me a percent yield of 107%. Now that's a little bit odd to obtain more than it is theoretically possible, but let's look at some potential sources of error. First of all, perhaps the reaction would be incomplete. All of the iron oxide did not react. That means that the final container would contain some iron as well as some of the unreacted iron oxide. Unreacted iron oxide would weigh more than iron, and that could lead to a percentage that's higher than 100%. Perhaps there was unwanted side reactions. Perhaps the iron, upon cooling, re reacted with the oxygen in the air reforming iron oxide. So as a result, I would have higher than expected actual amount, and again, causing me to have more than expected. There could be faulty separation methods, but that's not so much of an issue in this case, because carbon dioxide is a gas and would easily leave the iron behind. But if your method perhaps had filtration in it, that could lead to some faulty separation. Perhaps there were transfer errors, moving liquids in particular from one beaker to another can leave residues behind that will throw off your final answer. But in my particular case, because I got greater than 107%, it should make me question the purity of the stuff that I obtained at the end. So in this case, I would probably say that it was caused to a combination of my first two errors. So that's a quick look at reacting masses. We'll take a look at something called limiting reagents in our next program. Thanks for watching.